Welcome to the Violin Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Morgal, where I interview violinists from around the world. If you're new to the podcast, please be sure to hit the subscribe button for future episodes. My guest today is a violinist based in Virginia who is a professor, entrepreneur, and practice researcher. She is also the assistant professor of violin and coordinator of strings at Virginia Commonwealth University and the creator of Practisma. Please let me welcome Susanna Klein. Susanna, thanks so much for coming on to the Violin Podcast today. It's a pleasure to meet you, and I'm really looking forward to, you know, kind of picking your mind about practice tips, audition, prep, and kind of your, your, your own personal journey to the violin. How are you doing today? Good. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. As, as we're talking right now, it's a nice sunny day here in Massachusetts, but what's it like in Virginia? Is it, is it cloudy? Is it sunny? It's beautiful. Sunny October. October in Virginia are really beautiful. Usually. Wonderful. Yeah. So we're here in Western Mass. I'm sure actually we'll, we'll get to talk to you a little bit about um, your your orchestral engagements, and you have experience playing in Vermont Symphony. I'm sure you're aware of the New England foliage that happens every oh, yes. year. The I New England. Do, um, when I was in school at BU, I used to do a Made in Vermont tour mm. with uh, Vermont Symphony, which I think they're still doing, and it was gorgeous. It was like two weeks traveling through the state during you know the height of foliage, and it was magical. Oh, Just that's so cool. So it's kind of. Yeah, I think I think they're still doing that with the Vermont Symphony. They like travel to different parts of Vermont to kind of showcase the orchestra and do concerts, yes, right? In small towns, it's really it's really magical. That's amazing. Well, Susanna, let's get to know you a little bit, and for the audience to get to know you, who who is Susanna Klein? Um, tell us tell us about your story uh, with the violin and how it kind of brought you to where you are today. Yeah. Um, so let's see. I started with my mom um, when I was ten. She's an amateur violinist. And I wasn't very serious until really my, the summer before my senior year in high school, when um, I had kind of a side-by-side -side experience with a professional orchestra and boom, you know, in the flash of an instant, um, I scrapped my plans to study medicine and other things and decided I wanted to go into music. So I was a little bit of a late bloomer, I would say, um, which has influenced my trajectory. Then I went to VCU for undergrad, which is actually where I teach now. Um, went to BU, uh, Boston University for my master's to study with Roman Totenberg, who I had met at Kneisel Hall. Um, then I did a one-year stint in the Memphis Symphony. That was my first full-time job out of school. That wasn't a you know, part-time job in New England while I was in school. Um, figured out pretty quickly that I really don't know how to play the violin. I don't know how to learn repertoire quickly. Um, it was a really difficult year. It was a great year for me, but it was a difficult year for me because playing in a professional orchestra, the pace is much quicker. Truly an eye-opening experience. You know, I think that's something that um, conservatory students don't often get that like you're learning repertoire at such a fast pace. Some of it, you know, you learn in school right through orchestral repertoire classes, but a lot of it is very fast paced. So you have to be an excellent sight reader at times. Yes, and I was not, and I was not, I was a big practicer, but I wasn't a quick learner. I wasn't very efficient. So when we would have, we would have the last uh, concert of one week on a Saturday night. I mean, a Sunday afternoon, I'm sorry, Sunday afternoon. And then Sunday night, we would have the first rehearsal for the next week. And that kind of turnover of repertoire showed me that I was a baby. I didn't know anything, you know? So I went back to school, actually. I started my DMA. One thing led to another. I had a little viola stint for a year, et cetera, et cetera. Eventually, I think, I think at one point we all get like the viola bug, you know, yes, where we're like, oh. Sound. It's mm -hmm. great for your sound. If you, if you want to work on enriching your sound, I think playing viola is a wonderful way to do it. So I have no regrets about that. Um, eventually ended up coming back to the violin. And then my, I, I'm a quitter, I guess. I quit my DMA. Um, <laughs> I never finished because I felt like it was too academically driven and I was really more interested in the playing side. And then ended up getting a job in the Richmond Symphony um, down here in Richmond where I'd gone to school and I knew the town and my, my mom was in Northern Virginia at the time. So that seemed right. Plus they were willing to hire me. So there was that. Um, that's always a plus if they want to hire always you. A plus, you know, and actually I came in number two at that audition, but there were two slots. So, you know, Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's great then. Yeah. Yes, it can happen. Um, then from there, uh, three and a half years later, I auditioned, uh, I, well, I was taking auditions actually the whole time, you know, because uh, climbing up the orchestra ladder seemed what I really wanted to do. Um, and then I auditioned for Colorado Symphony and came in number three, but they had three openings. 
So again, number three. That's good. <laughs> That's great. You're like right at the nick of it. Right. So you just never know. You don't always have to be first. Um, went out there and uh, loved the orchestra, actually loved, loved the town, but did not love being in the middle of the country. Um, partly because I have family on the East Coast and in Germany, it just seemed kind of off the beaten path and was looking really to come back to the East Coast. Um, thought I was going to go into orchestra management and then um, a, a surprise spot came open in Richmond, my old orchestra principal second. And so I came back and I re-auditioned for my former orchestra. Um, somehow got that job. There was only one opening that time. <laughs> so there I really Fabulous. had to get my act together. Um, uh, did that eventually dislocated my shoulder, unrelated to playing, but it led to just a um, couple years of drama of, you know, having a bum arm, let's put it that way, and started looking for other opportunities. And a few years later, I had already, I had always been teaching. That was sort of a constant in my life. And I was teaching adjunct at VCU and U University of Richmond. And I really loved that age group. I love, I really love working with young adults, maybe because I was so messed up during that time in my own life but when the job came open at VCU I was like I have to do this I have to somehow finagle my way into this job because that's what I really really would like to do and so I've been at VCU since 2008 um, and so now I do a combination of things I teach of course um, I write I play still part-time for the symphony um, whenever you know they need to hire extra players um, I do some chamber music, some solo, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And it turns out that that is actually how I'm really happy. I didn't really realize that that, that variety is really good for me. I need, I need that as a person. I found that too, that if I am only focused on one thing, I get bored really easily. I'm kind of like a, an, a fly in that sense. I'm like, okay, well, I, I do one thing. I'm like, okay, I'm bored. And then I want to do something else. So I think having that variety, even as a musician, you know, it also you know, you, you, you dip your feet into different genres because orchestra is also very good. But if you stay in an orchestra for too long and you know all the rep, you know it's going to be sitting in, on your stand, I, I, I can assume that it can get really dull. I mean, how many times can you play Beethoven 5 in orchestra? Yeah. You know? I, don't, and, I don't know that the music ever got dull for me, but and I wouldn't have described myself as unhappy at all. It's just in retrospect, I now realize that the autonomy that I have and the variety that I have... Um, suit me more, I guess. But, you know, there's a lot that you can't control in orchestra. Most, it's most true. Uh, Very orchestras true. have either frozen seating. Um, you know, they have the same music director. I mean, the very big orchestras, they get a lot of variety, but most most orchestras, you know, have a fairly consistent mm -hmm. sort of setup, who you're going to work with, who you're going to sit next to, how long the rehearsals are going to be. And you don't really have control over most of it. You know, if the rehearsal is at 10, that's when you show up. You don't really say, oh, you know, I, I'm not feeling it today. I'd like to rehearse later. Yeah. At that point, at, at that point, it kind of feels like a nine to five job. Like, okay, you have to be, you know, of course you have to be 15 minutes early or even more so before you, before the downbeat or b before the A. But I think that's kind of what drew me away from the orchestra life. I, uh, for the listeners listening, of course, I, I spent a lot of my undergrad preparing those excerpts. Schumann Scherzo, Mendelssohn Scherzo, Don Juan, all, all that stuff. And then, and then I thought to myself, I'm like, well, yeah, I don't have that much control over my career. And to me, you know, for, for some violinists, that's like their path. You know, they want to do orchestra, pursue the orchestra life, fine, that's great. But I wanted a little bit more control over my music and also my career. I think it was more so like, if I'm going to be doing this for the rest of my life, I want to be able to control the things that I want to do. And it seems like it's the same way for you. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Um, sure. Autonomy is really important. I mean, this has been shown in research in, in all fields, the more autonomy somebody has within their job or within their career, um, the more satisfied they will feel. So even, you know, for full-time orchestra players, the ones that I know that I would describe as happiest are all people who have side projects going on where they can really control what they play, how they're interacting with other people, you know, uh, a higher purpose, however they want to define that. So I think that's really important. Whether you get paid for that additional work or not is not as important. But I think just to have things that are um, truly within your own sphere, I think that 
that's really important. Thank you for sharing. Um, I want to I want to go back to that dislocated shoulder because that's something that I wasn't expecting to hear from you actually after doing my no, research about you. But for a long uh, time I didn't talk about it. For a long time I didn't talk about it because I thought, oh, then people will think I can't play, or you know. Now it's so far in the past that I'm like, okay, it's fine. Well, no, but I I want to talk about the the rehabilitation process for you as a violinist and as an upper string player. You know, for for violin is you know wooden box was not meant to go on our shoulder but we figured out a way over f hundreds of years to make it more organic you know quote unquote organic on our shoulder but if you have a dislocated shoulder then obviously you might run into some problems you know you couldn't play for a while but how is the rehabilitation process after you have um after after that incident it was long it was a, it was a long journey and it was um it ended up having a really positive influence on me as a player, actually, because I was limited by the number of hours that I could do, to, uh, you know, the number of hours before pain set in. So I became a lot more efficient. I did a lot more mental study. I would sometimes learn entire folders in my head for the orchestra. Um, you know, I was principal second. So my job was um, try to play as many of the notes as I can and do not come in at the wrong time. And it turns out most of that you can do with mental practice because um, you don't have to play up as high. You don't have to, you know, do some of the more technical things. For second violence, yeah. Um, so it had a big influence on me, both because it was psychologically tough and because I, for the first time, became more efficient and more optimizing in my own practice. Um, and also the road to recovery was interesting psychologically because I had to really start trusting myself about what was working and what wasn't working. And that was new for me. So the first um, few physical therapists I had, and even the first doctor, I mean, essentially did nothing for me. It was really frustrating. And I didn't know how to get better. I became increasingly discouraged. And so I had to reach out to people. Who do you know? I had to trust myself that maybe, maybe I wasn't getting the right information. Maybe I wasn't either being taken seriously or they don't understand. What's right. Happening. Getting, getting, a, getting another opinion. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And I ended up then finally with like a shoulder specialist at um, VCU health. It's the hospital that's connected to my university and um, Lori Mishner. Uh, she's probably not listening to this cause she's not a violinist, but boy, she saved me and she saved me mostly because she was a great physical therapist, but also because she led me to be really data driven about my own recovery. So I remember asking her late in kind of PT process, um, you know, what about other things? Should I try acupuncture? You know, should I try massage? What else should I be doing? Uh, because essentially we had sort of discovered that I had thoracic outlet syndrome. It's more medical drama, but I don't need to go into the whole thing. But um, she said, yes, yes, you should explore everything. You're a violinist. You know, this is your trade. So any, any, bit of comfort for you is going to be important. She said, however, what you shouldn't do is throw the kitchen sink at yourself simultaneously. So you don't know what works. You need to be really data driven, get a journal. If you're going to do massage, do that, you know, four to eight weeks, write down how you felt before, how you felt after, how long did the effects last? You know, give your massage therapist good directions. Don't be afraid to speak up. If you do acupuncture, do the same thing, but then stop doing your massage so that you can be really scientific about what's happening with you. And that was great advice, it turns out, for my shoulder and um, for life too. Yeah, and I can definitely tell by the way you're talking about your injury, you're also, you also incorporate that kind of data-driven uh, philosophy towards your Practisma practice journal. Right. So I'd like to kind of transition into that because there are a whole bunch of topics that I like to talk to you about when it comes to Practisma. First of all, for the audience who doesn't know what Practisma is, what is Practisma? Um, the official definition? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a made up word, of course. Um, yeah. And no it's right. I think Practisma for me, when I was reading your, your stuff, it was more like uh, 
That was like an it's an idea. Practice was an, an idea. idea. Yeah, an idea. It, right, exactly. It's it's a made up word, but it's a more more of an idea of like of how you should practice. Yeah. So the official definition that I have for myself is one: the feeling of empowerment, efficiency, and joy associated with practicing music, and two: a healthy state of being for practicing musicians, both physically and psychologically. Um, and that's because I. Uh, you know, I kind of coined a term because I needed a name and it turns out I was always talking about certain concepts, but it um, took me a long time every time to explain the, oh, empowerment, efficiency, and joy. And I'm also interested in that. And I think people should be healthy, you know. And um, so I started just using a term for it. Um, practisma, like charisma, you know, practice, but more fun kind of thing. Um, I'm always about I'm always about encouraging my students to make practice more fun because I think part of the I think part of the problem with the violence is that people sometimes dread practicing and I think the most absolutely. successful yeah I think the most successful people with most successful musicians that enjoy the process of practicing actually become really <laughs> successful in, in in my view and I, it's it's clear to me that that's exactly what you're trying to go for trying to make it more enjoyable. <laughs> Yeah, enjoyable, um, more data driven. That's a lot of it. Um, more empowered. Um, it's really about kind of a coaching philosophy. So the genesis of it is, I guess, a lot of it goes back to my own practice and my my realizations, particularly after school. I think this was really true when I was taking auditions. This is where auditions were really important for me. Um, when I had big breakthroughs, whether it was on stage or in my own practice, it was never because of the amount of time that I put in or, you know, a certain practice session, it was always, for me, it was always a psychological shift that, that precipitated that breakthrough, you know, becoming more daring. Um, you know, I once, <laughs> I once made uh, 20, 20 um, play dates. <laughs> I called them play dates um, 20 times in a row of playing for somebody. And, you know, after, after five, you have no friends left. You have to start calling random people. Hey, um, right, yeah. We met once at a gig, can I go play for you? You know, um, uh, practicing for two weeks with earplugs in to get a bigger sound because somebody had told me uh, was was wonderfully honest with me when I said, you know, what's really wrong with my playing after I'd gotten booted out of the first round yet again? Um, what's really wrong with my playing? And uh, she said, you know. Oh, I don't want to tell you. And, you know, I know everything's fine. I said, no, I need to hear the truth. What is the, if you could change one thing about my playing, what would it be? And um, she said, I'm going to say it in Spanish, but it's just like, you lack cojones, you know? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you lack cojones. For what, for what orchestra was this for? <laughs> this was for um, Kennedy Center Opera. Okay. All right. And, so uh, yeah, big, big time orchestra job. Yeah. And, and yeah, the, people had skirted around this issue. Oh, you know, you need more forte or, you know, you need a little more articulation. And they kind of the, beat around the bush. And, yes, she yeah. put the cards on the table and that was it for me. You know, I went home, I put in earplugs, I practiced fortissimo for two weeks. Nothing but that dynamic. And that's you know, when I got a bigger sound and a, and a different mindset. So for me, the breakthroughs as a player have been through um, mind shifts changing the psychology. <clears throat> and I knew this, I wanted this for my students. And I was always kind of struggling how to design that kind of experience for my students, because that really has, it's hard to teach in a lesson. A lesson is more about, here's how you shift, here's what your bow speed should be doing. Certainly phrasing, but it's about mechanics. Some of these mind, um, these shifts in beliefs, I guess, you need experiences for those. You can't tell somebody, oh, you should believe this. That doesn't work. People have to really come to those beliefs themselves. And so I was working on that already at the university. And then um, in 2011, uh, the VCU basketball team, which was essentially unranked nobody, you know, we were, we were not on the charts for anybody, um, was in March Madness. And um, they made it to the final four. And it was this big Cinderella upset. And because I live, I have two sons, and my husband, I live with all boys. So sports is kind of a thing in the house always. And I was following the coach, um, Shaka Smart, who's now at UT Austin. And he's so psychology driven. 
and everything that he was doing, I thought, yes, this is what I want to be doing with my students. I want to be coaching the psychology of, around practice and around becoming a musician, you know, not just the nuts and bolts. And so that's, I really started studying what is sports doing that we're not, because they're way ahead of us. I mean, notice there are sports psychologists. There are no music psychologists, you know, for musicians. I mean, they're they're studying the effects of music, but not, you know, how to sort of be a best musician. And um, sports is data-driven and they're really good at, you know, having a vocabulary about, you know, team spirit and don't quit. And um, when you say I can't ask, you know, how can I, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I, from there, I kind of went a little bit into, all right, what is it that I really feel like from my own experience musicians need? What do they need to develop the characteristics? And I came up with five. I have like, it's Crodo for short. Um, creativity, resilience, optimism, discipline, and organization. Those are the five. And we started journaling in the studio um, in 2011. And every year from that year forward, um, and I just made stuff up <laughs> from my own experience, you know, action prompts and, and reflection prompts and keeping track of what we're doing. And the students helped me identify what was really uh, working and what wasn't um, in terms of the things that I was asking them to do. So they, they were a huge help. And then, you know, finally a friend of mine was like, you're, you know, people are borrowing your stuff. You should probably just publish. If, if people are borrowing your, your prompts at other universities, this is the sign. <laughs> yeah, this is a sign that you're doing something right. Yeah, yeah. So I, I love what you said that there are no music psychologists. There are sports psychologists, but not music psychologists. There are music therapists, but not so much music psychologists in terms of like preparing a student for a competition per se. I mean, I think there are like there are like, I don't know if you ever read the, the inner game of tennis, that yes. book. Yeah. So that's like a clear example. I, there's the, that author also made the inner, the inner game of music, but for some reason, musicians relate more to the, the tennis book, but yeah, I, I don't know off the top of my head, if there are any kind of like music psychologists that like talk to specific performers on how to perform at their peak. I mean, you could always do, there are performance coaches it's starting to come but um and i i do think that's really important um but you know it's not just about performance it's not just performance where we have a problem it's also practice yes um, yes you know i think in sports which again is more data driven and has a culture of sort of posters and um rah 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 you know like uh sports there's a, there's a whole culture around excellence and love of the game and mental toughness, those three things. And I don't know that we talk about it so specifically in music. Um, at least not yet. Yes. That's my At hope. least not yet. Yeah. And I, talking because but, there are ways that you can, there are ways that, you know, all these things that I talked about, like creativity, resilience, optimism, discipline, organization, those are learned behaviors. Now they're learned through experience often, but there are many of them, some of them might be inborn. You might be strong in one naturally and you know weaker in another, but they can be developed, but they have to be practiced just like scales have to be practiced. So would you say, Susanna, that practisma is more so for the student that's like above the age of 18? I feel like I, you know, practisma, like in terms of like the structure, the organization, like how to practice, I think is fantastic. But in terms of like the mental aspects of like how to perform at your peak is really difficult to kind of explain towards like a, like a five or six year old, which, you know, I'm, yes. you know, I do a lot of beginner, I teach a lot of beginner violinists, Suzuki book one through three. Um, and also I do have a handful of students in high school who are of course at a much higher level. And I, I, uh, what, what would your thoughts be on that? Is your, is your practice model I think, like I think high school? Yeah. I think high school and up. I think you're right about that. I certainly think you could adapt some of the things that I do in the journal for your younger students. So, um, yes, I was, I, I agree with that. 
you know, I ask students to students or people, you know, to keep track in their practice when they when they journal, when they put down what they do, to keep track of important things. Um, I have these acronyms: deep dive, DD, right? Our most granular work, often necessary for new pieces, right? Really breaking things up, acquiring really new stuff. Um, RE is refine, sort of that second layer of learning. Um, gloss over, big picture, run through, just checking in. <laughs> um, v, every time you video record. Um, A, every time you audio record yourself. M, every time you use the metronome. T, every time you use the tuner. You could use those. Yeah, of course, but, right. But it wouldn't be appropriate for somebody who is not struggling or self-aware yet of their own struggle. You don't want to introduce that psychologically. Like a reflection e prompt, you know, is, um, I think this is week three. What it's called the zone. What makes practice the easy? zone? I like it. <laughs> Again, from sports, they talk about the zone and the floor. being in the zone. Yeah, and you know this. I, I I love this conversation because I've always tried to connect music into sports because I was an athlete growing up. I was a track athlete, okay. so a lot. Of, so I did a lot of running. I mean, granted, like I, I did basketball, I did volleyball, but I really resonated with track because it was like an independent sport. But some people. Um, some people do like the team effort. So like I, I do sometimes make the connection, like how an orchestra is related to like a basketball team because they're all working towards one goal. The coach is like a conductor and you kind of, you know, kind of guide the, the mental aspect of the groups. Um, I, I do want, I, yeah. Go ahead. Well, actually I was going to say if conductors were more like coaches, I actually think we would have a whole nother level of music making. I feel like often they're great musicians and great conductors, but I don't know that I've ever on the podium heard a speech. Come on, guys. Like, I know you have it. Get out of your head. Play with abandon. Commit yourself. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I will be there at the finish line. I will let you take it wherever you want to go. I want you to really go swinging hard. I don't know that I've ever heard that from the podium. You know, it's more about let's be together. Let's be sensitive. At least in the professional orchestra aspect, like I can, I can see that, like I've, I've experienced it myself, like in youth orchestras, where you have that kind of like, we're all trying to achieve this one goal, let's all try to work together. So I think that's like a great kind of team, team philosophy that you can introduce in an orchestral setting at a, in a youth, or, youth orchestra. But I do want to go back to something uh, that you said very, that was very specific that I want to touch upon about learning experiences. And I think when teaching a, a teaching a young student as opposed to teaching an adult, teaching an adult, I think they learn more through failure. They learn more through the learning experience. So can you talk about, can you elaborate a little bit more about that, um, the importance of that, that learning experience for, for adult students, like 18 plus, like with your the college students, part the failure the, part of it. Yeah. The other F word. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, it's, 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 really important and we shy away from it. Part of it is because um, we are learning in public often. And so there's a kind of shame component, right? We, we wanna do our best because the way that we learn is by, is by performing in some way or another, whether that's in a lesson or whether that's in a quartet rehearsal or in a you know, larger concert, but it's really, really important. It's important to learn in public and lots of failures is how you get to success. I mean, in a certain sense, practicing itself, when we show up, we are dealing with that other F word from the minute we start playing, right? What, Cause we're looking for what's not quite sounding right. What's not quite in tune. What's, what could I be doing better? That's sort of our whole setup. Um, so getting comfortable with failure as a, a part of long-term success is, is really important. Um, you know, resilience, like for me, I have a, I have a lot of questions for that. I ask for myself or for, for my students about each category of sort of mental toughness that I'm trying to promote. And for resilience, my questions are, am I really going for it or am I playing it safe? Can I push True. through when things get tough? Am I okay with lots of little failures as part of long-term success? Do I practice taking on risk just as I practice my scales? And do I accept that I will be learning in public? 
those are those are huge questions. Um, those are really big questions, but they're all very valid. I think that I'm just kind of just like remembering like my time in my studio classes and in my undergrad and graduate school. Like I think those were the things that I would constantly be thinking about when I go on stage or play in front of my colleagues, my, my future colleagues in the professional world, because that's like such a very tight knit. Uh, community where everybody knows how to how the instrument works, and everybody knows whether you failed or not. So I think there's like that extra layer or extra level of um, scrutiny, scrutiny, and maybe a little bit of anxiety that we all sure. that we often get in music school. And um, that I, I yeah, no, 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 you can go ahead. <laughs> um, that's where I think we we can how we talk about things really matters, both as teachers and as fellow musicians. Um, you know, when, when we hope that a concert is the culmination of all this ho- hard work, um, that sets up the expectation for something, which is that you wanna do really, really well, or you want your students to do well, rather than, you know, this is just the first of, I don't know, maybe five times that you'll play this. Okay, get the first one out of the way, get, you know, get the jitters out. Let's, let's go out there and, and get the first draft. Out. Yes, yes, I totally agree with that. About it. I totally agree with that. I think that you're never going to get on your first try. Yes. Yeah, I, you know, I, I truly say, believe that. I say in the book, um, in the introduction, um, I repeat what my teacher told me, and I didn't accept it at the time. It took me maybe another 20 years, and I'm still working on it. But he said, don't be greedy. You know, and I think I say that to my students now all the time, but I also just try to say, hey, let's get that first draft out there. We really need to take the first draft out on stage and kind of see what happens. And um, so that we don't keep our our performances in these little glass cases and then take them out. And then we usually perform once and then we're very disappointed because it didn't go 100% as it should when in reality, you probably only lost like five or 10%. And, you know, I had a good friend, this is before Memphis, actually, my first job was hugely helpful. She asked me, she was my roommate and very close colleague. uh, We were talking about performance anxiety. And she said, what's your worst fear? And I said, "Um, that they laugh at me, that, that, that they think I'm a hack, that I have no right to be there. And she said, Susanna, you may not play your best, that's possible, but you are too advanced and you play too well to be a hack. Like even you on a bad day, nobody's gonna laugh at you, you're not gonna be a hack. So you need to kind of separate that. Wow, what a good friend. (laughs) Yes, and I remember, you know, there's only so low you can go within a certain skill level. We don't think that. We think that it's, oh my God, it was so terrible. No, it wasn't. It was, you know, 10% worse than usual. Yeah, and I explain that to my students as well. It's about the difference between perception and reality. The reality is, is that you actually didn't suffer that much. Perception is like, oh my God, the world's going to end. Yes. So I think, I think really trying to understand that perception versus reality battle within ourselves, once we kind of get out of that shell, then I think anything is possible. Yeah. And sports, you know, again, coming back to sports, but they're ahead of us. You'll notice in tennis, which is the sport that I follow the most, because I think it's, it reminds me the most of playing. Um, But they do all the little baby tournaments before they get to the French Open, before they get to the US Open. Like players don't go cold into these uh, big competitions. Now they're actually playing other people. So that's doubly important, but they have a long stretch of what they call the season where they're getting out there and playing because that's, that's how they're going to improve their game is by actually playing, not practicing. Um, that's true. It's being a uh, focusing on the what's on the court as opposed to, you know, the, the weight room per se, you know, yes, exactly. It's a different skill. It's, it's a different skill. I, I, I find that practicing is kind of like when you go to the weight room, you, you know, you try to build those, those violent muscles per se. Right. Yes. And then once you go on the court, for tennis and the, or if you go on stage that's when you're playing the game but it but the, the only difference though is that you're competing against someone but yeah, and so there's I, an unpredictability factor there right? there's an unpredictability factor but also i think one can argue that music is totally not related to sports in the sense that you know music you're not supposed to 
you're not supposed to compete against one another. Do you have any thoughts on that argument? Um, yes, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't think the reason that we uh, often give ourselves a hard time um, in music is because necessarily we think we're competing with somebody else. I used to think that. I think when, certainly when I was doing auditions, it was all about the competition. But, you know, I have a job and I've had several jobs and I still, if I don't play my best, um, I am upset about that. And I'm not trying to compete with somebody. Um, I think we, we love it so much. We care about it so much when we're in the zone and it's going well, it is an incredibly rich experience. When we're not able to be in the zone, um, I think it's much more complicated than I'm a little embarrassed. I think there is, there's a lot of stuff in there psychologically. Why am I doing this? Um, what am I getting out of it? Maybe there's something wrong with me. I'm untalented. The mental game of sports and the mental game of music, I think are similar, even though, yes, we do not compete directly against somebody else. Unless, you know, our, unless of course, you're in a violent competition, but I feel like, right. yeah. And that's a whole nother level. But we know from psychology research that the things that influence you know, our habits and our beliefs and our feelings are our feelings, our beliefs, those, those are our thoughts and our actions. This is yeah. the same. So you can have a big influence on the way that you perceive yourself by how you act. And I think that's the part that I really want, um, the, particularly students that I work with, to realize. So for example, early on in the journaling process, I would uh, ask students to record, record a whole lesson, transcribe it, or record a whole practice session, see what you notice. That had devastating effects. Actually, nobody liked it. Um, nobody got a lot out of it. And they didn't feel empowered. It was quite the opposite. They felt uh, quite downtrodden. If, however, I asked them, um, and I do this, this one did make it in the journal um, as a prompt. Hold on, page 24. Um, it's called The Good, the Bad, and the Surprising. Um, this week, record yourself a little bit every single time you practice. Aim for some audio and some video, but very short sections. List what you notice, good, bad, or surprising. And then I have like day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. I make space for writing what you notice. It turns out that if people record themselves once every practice, and actually I say twice because you should record yourself before you work on a passage and after, but five days in a row, very small segments, they feel very good about themselves. So in both ways, you've record, you said record yourself, but very different results psychologically. And because of that psychology, they are either more likely to record themselves again and use that data or not. And so that, I think sports is very similar like that. You can be, you have to be careful about what you're asking people to do because the way that they do their work and the way that you talk about it as a teacher influences how they're going to feel about it and then proceed in the future. Yeah, I think it's all about objectivity. I think with music, everything has become subjective. But in terms of like practicing, practicing can be very objective because what I was taught growing up and as well as in my collegiate years, that if you're listening to yourself or listening to a recording of yourself, try to interpret that as how can I help this person that's on the screen as opposed to, oh, that was terrible. Got to get that passage yes, going along of instead of getting the judgment out of it like how, if i was a teacher how can i help this person be better and then you write notes down yeah. right that's how i that's how i did it and that's, that's right. how i encourage that's how i yeah. encourage all my like you know older students high school students to do yeah and one thing you can do and you can do it with young students or uh, old students it doesn't matter is to ask them to listen back and only talk about one thing this is actually a huge with, with um, players who are particular are not used to recording themselves. It's just like, okay, we're going to record one phrase. Um, we're going to listen back just for intonation. That's it. We're not going to talk about anything else. Fix a couple things, record again. 
or we're going to, I often do this with students where I'm going to video record them. And then I turn the audio off. We're just watching. We're just watching. It's like a mirror, but you know, more powerful. Um, we don't need to hear and judge our playing. We can just, if we're working on posture or hand position or something. So if you can have selective attention to the feedback that's given, um, I think that can make it more objective. So in baseball, you know, they'll have like a speed gun for the, how fast was the pitch? They're not also giving back tons of data about this was the wind up and it was this kind of pitch and this is what the left hand was doing. It's just, what is the speed? That's it. It, it measures a singularity. So I think mm -hmm. that can be really powerful if you want to be data driven as opposed to story driven. Story driven is how good am I? How talented am I? Yeah, I think in terms of the sto I think in terms of the story driven, the story driven is more where the artistry comes in. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. We're just talking about we're just talking about numbers, data from like a scientific standpoint. Like if I were to make this like better, what are the mechanics of how I make that better? But in terms of the story, in terms of how I'm able to connect with my audience. That's where the, that's where like the next level artistry comes in. Yes. So like, for example, I have used um, a heart rate monitor um, to show students how heart rate is in live performing, like in masterclass. So the person performing will be wearing the heart rate monitor, but everybody else can see it on the iPad, how their heart rate is changing. Um, and then basically, you know, I just work with players like, can you through breathing lower your heart rate, you know, as you're walking on stage, right? It's very empowering for them to see that it actually works. Oh my God, I'm lowering my heart rate. I'm doing it. So now they're feeling better about that process instead of just me saying, uh, try to breathe deeply, you know, don't feel anxiety. Like they need to be able to measure the thing that they're doing. And then instead they can use their story for how do I lower my heart rate? I breathe deeply. I pretend I'm, I don't know, at an oasis or at my favorite restaurant at home. Whatever image they have in their head yes. that will help them relax. Yeah. Yes, because creativity is really, really important for music. Um, but I sometimes just think we use it, we, we're quick to use it in the negative and not in the positive. So we're really good at what if my lesson is going to suck? What if my teacher doesn't think I've done a good job? What if I don't get, you know, first chair? We're good at pretending that, but we're not as good at pretend to be somewhere else or let me watch somebody on YouTube. Let me pretend to be that player. Let me actually copy the bow arms of that professional player and see if I can play like that. That can have a huge effect. That's that's positive creativity. Well, this is just an amazing conversation. I just I love what we're talking about, how we're combining the music into sports, because you know, I have a like I just finished watching the NBA finals and I just like you know, like I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of basketball and so is my wife, but there's always been that like correlation between like music and sports for me. So I'm, I'm so glad that there's, there's another mind out there um, to talk it's about that. Throw. I mean, if you want to see what, you know, playing in public is like, it's the free throw. That's what it's like. Right. And everybody Absolutely. knows they could make that shot under pressure mm -hmm. much more easily than they could. <laughs> Exactly. And pressure meaning guarded, you know, having people on them as opposed to everybody clear and just having to make the shot. Sure. Well, I want to apply some of what we talked about with the Practisma Journal into auditions mm -hmm. because right now we're in the fall and there are a lot of students out there or even, you know, students who are going to be either entering college or leaving college and they have no idea what to do. Do I do I take a gap year to kind of figure things out? Do I audition for orchestras? I mean, we're still really uncertain because of this COVID-19 pandemic of what the orchestra scene is going to be like, at least in pertaining to the United States. You know, you can see that there are rehearsals and concerts happening like with London Symphony in Vienna. And, but just for like, for the students in the United States, what are some advice that you give your students during this time to kind of help cope with what's happening and to help them prepare for the challenges that will bring a, a musician for the next yeah, generation. COVID. I, like it wasn't difficult enough already. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like it wasn't difficult already. Yeah. 
<laughs> right. I, I think about that, you know, what it's like right now to be in music school or to be trying to decide. Um, you know, the, I think the biggest thing that people need to be doing, and they need to be doing it even um, before COVID hit, is to diversify their skill set. I think that's a good recipe for a career. And that's a good recipe for human happiness too. And just to be clear, when you mean diversify your skill set, do you mean within the music world or do you mean diversifying like outside of your instrument, but still pertaining to your music career? Um, can be either. Okay. You're always going to tie them together. So notice like you're podcasting, but you're podcasting about the violin or about music, right? It's yeah. not going to be like totally random off field, but um, it can, it can be whatever. So if somebody has an interest in writing, it can be writing and music. If somebody has an interest in, in um, technology, do you know what I mean? Maybe a minor in, uh, you know, something computer related. Um, you know, we need, we need apps out there. <laughs> we need data-driven information. I'm actually big about, um, you know, developing some te technology uh, for players. Um, but diversifying the skill set. I think is always a good idea, whether that's with a degree or just, you know, these days you can just do stuff and just learn, learn everything learn on online. YouTube. Yeah. You just learn it. You don't always need a degree. So I would say that I, I am very positive. If you, again, if you study music and you do it at that high level where organization, discipline, optimism, resilience, and creativity is going to be part of what you do every day. I think there's nothing you can't do. I mean, I, I don't think it railroads you into a career that you're going to have to dig yourself out of. Like, you know, um, I think you're going to remain open. I think you're going to find your, your path. Similar I mean, to what you said. Also, you know, you're not going to get on the first try. Oh, absolutely. You're not. never, you're never going to get on the first try. You know, I can't tell you how many times I failed. Um, trying to start different projects. Like I try to start a nonprofit. I try, you know, that like crashed and burned. Um, <laughs> you know, there are so many things that if you just do consistently throughout, throughout a long period of time, which I preach about, you know, you're never going to get it on first time. If you do it for the same thing over and over again for a long period of time, you're going to start like getting some traction, getting some momentum. And I'm still, you know, to this day, always trying to get traction for the podcast. So, um, and it you takes know, it, a lot of hustle. It takes yes. a lot of hustle. You know, it doesn't matter if you want to play orchestra, you'll be taking tons of auditions and lessons and training and all sorts of stuff. Or you want to be doing podcasting or writing. Everything worth doing takes tremendous hustle. It takes putting yourself out there, putting yourself in uncomfortable situations, right? Learning resilience, um, you know, failing, getting back up again. And you just got to say, okay, when's the next one? Um, right. I, at some point, I, I had heard about this. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the the hundred rejections thing. It was going viral for a while. I haven't heard about the one hundred rejections. No, yeah, I haven't. Thing, I, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who started it, but it really influenced me, and so I started doing that, like making as a goal a hundred rejections, as opposed to when am I gonna achieve something? When am I gonna get that job? Or when am I gonna get it published? Or who's gonna like me? It's like just go down the list, you know, and just do it. Just got to try and, just you know, it. because the more, the more quickly you fail, the sooner you'll succeed. I and mean, that's, that's just, that's and just it, the truth. And anyone right. in any industry will tell you that. And in it, yeah, ex exactly in any industry, it's not just music yes. it's in any and industry. Yeah. Unless you're a doctor or a pilot and you're about to kill somebody by your fatal errors. Um, you know, go forth and, and make tons of them. <laughs> right, exactly. But, <laughs> but what I don't think, it, you know, if you make a mistake, you won't die. Right. I think that's with music. I think that's like super, super important to like when you're on stage and you feel like you've had a disaster, you're still there. You're not dead. You're still yeah. alive. Like you can still regroup. And yeah, will it, will it be painful? Oh yeah. It'll be very painful. But I think- painful to you. Only painful oh. to you. Nobody will be disappointed in you. The only the only person that's going to give you a hard time is yourself. True. And that's where I think we, we do need to... I think the way we talk our, to ourselves really has to change. I mean, this is... Again, you know, after 30 years in the industry, it's very easy for me to say, but I think if being ruthless with ourselves was a good strategy for getting the most done, 
I'm all about it, but it's not. It's not effective. It erodes confidence over time. Um, there are better ways, like if we're just talking about stage fright, that part of it, there are, um, there are some things, I put them on my website, like tips for stage fright, but they're not actual tips. They're like, go do something. <laughs> Go, sure. The tip is go, to do yeah. it. <laughs> the two, yeah, the, the yeah. tip is it's to go like, out I'm there. Teaching you. I'm not teaching you. You're teaching yourself. You know, a lot of people know these run up and down the stairs. You guys can look them up, but no warm up. Yeah, I did. Up. I did read that one. Go up and down the stairs and then play your excerpt. Yeah, and I did, um, all that. I did queen of the night. That was very painful. <laughs> your alarm for the middle of the night to get up run through your whole list go back if be, be careful when you do that though like if you have if you live in an apartment neighbors. building or if you have neighbors yeah. or anything yeah. then you know you want to be careful about that but neighbors. the power uh power commercials that's how i got my richmond job i remember doing that that's um, awesome but um you know i think diversify your skill set <clears throat> it, it'll multiply the people number of people that you know you know, innovations are often not in one industry or another. They're kind of at the juncture of industries. That's often where innovation takes place. So I kind of like that whole concept. And I like the idea of meeting more people and being being out there. And if you, if you think that you don't have time for it because you have to practice, 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 I would just challenge you, can you achieve more while practicing less? Well, I think that's... Like a, not optimizing. Right. So, and I think that's a great place to kind of end the podcast. So Susanna, thank you so much. Make sure that you check out practisma.com. I'm going to leave a link in the podcast description notes so that way you can learn more about Susanna, what she's up to. And uh, you can also grab a copy of Practisma on our website. Really, really awesome stuff. Susanna, thank you so much for sharing all your thank knowledge. You. Yeah, definitely. And hope for many more. Hopefully, again, this is, not, this, is the, this is just the first draft of many conversations to come, hopefully. Love that. First so um, anyways, everybody, if you, haven't done so, if you haven't done so already, please make sure to hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification so that way you get notified on when these podcasts come out. And I also want to invite you to our Patreon page. You know, as production costs, go up uh we know we need some help on the violin podcast so a dollar two dollars five dollars will really help the podcast per month so i'll also leave that in the description below so that way you can check it out thanks so much everyone